Hello, everybody. I am Louis uh, Streb. I am your content enrichment specialist for the advanced med searches. And today I'll be going over some of the concepts with patients who are experiencing problems with their thyroid, their parathyroid glands. So um, this is chapter 58 um, in your book for 265. If you look at your syllabus, your syllabus is pretty clear on what it wants you to look at. It wants you to look at pages 1249 through 1263, which is this entire chapter for 58. So we're pretty much gonna cover all the thyroid and parathyroid. So where I want you to start and always focus first is that we're talking about cellular regulation. You have to get an understanding of what it is you're trying to accomplish with your patient before you ever know what you're gonna look and see, what you're going to observe, or what kind of signs and symptoms should be there, and what kind of treatment options are gonna be available. So if we're thinking about cellular, cellular regulation, your book talks about this um, in relation to hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism, we're gonna talk about what the thyroid does a little bit, but um, what we're gonna focus on kind of secondary is how nutrition and gas exchange are impaired um, due to cellular regulation problems secondary to hypothyroidism. I know it sounds kind of weird, but what I want you to really kind of focus on and think about here is that when you, when you think about thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland and what they do, they're, they're affecting your metabolism. So nutrition, gas exchange, electrolyte imbalances, um, all of these kind of things. So it really is an entire body system. So now we're going to talk with endocrine. We typically talk on opposite sides. We either have a hypo function, meaning too little of the hormone required to make the organ work correctly or the, the process in the body, or we have a hyper um, release of that uh, hormone, if you will. So to start, we'll talk about hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is a condition where you don't have enough, either you don't have a thyroid gland that is producing the thyroid hormone, or you have a reduced secretion of that gland um, reducing the hormones you need. So it really does decrease your metabolism. We talk about metabolism, we're talking about the speed of energy consumption in your body, um, the heat of your body, the, the way you burn calories, the way your body metabolizes energy. That's what we're referring to when we say your metabolism. So if we start thinking about hy uh, hypothyroidism, all you need to think about is your body's overall decreased metabolism, really on that hormonal level. And most of the signs and symptoms are going to really kind of pop out and show you what we're talking about. So we'll kind of look at this. Um, we're going to talk about some of the different drugs and things of that nature, um, kind of the, the function of the thyroid, things of that nature. All right, so when we kind of move down and we look at hypothyroidism, it's really a metabolic rate issue. So that lower meta metabolic rate or metabolism that's super low, it, it, it's perpetuated. It causes the hypothalamus is, as well as your anterior pituitary gland to make you know, stimulatory hormones that increase the TSH. So if you don't remember what, what, the, what the whole system looks like, you have a pituitary gland that sits right in, in the middle of your skull there, right? Um, kind of down, uh, it looks like, I, you know what it looks like. So it, it's, it's, it looks like a, a, a uh, I always think like that little sack that hangs on the back of a truck when you drive around. That's kind of what it looks like. It's got a front and a back. So it's got an anterior and a posterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland secretes hormones that stimulate organs typically to produce uh, other hormones. So like a thyroid stimulating hormone is released by the pituitary that goes to the thyroid gland and then tells the thyroid, hey, you need to secrete, you know, thyroid hormone. So it's kind of indirectly related. So hypothyroidism could be caused by the pituitary gland having an issue where it's not putting out enough TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, or it could be a problem with actually... Uh, you have a problem with the thyroid itself, and the thyroid could have a tumor, it could have a goiter, it could have something like that, that when, when you think about the TSH that's being released by the pituitary gland, sometimes it doesn't do what it's supposed to, and it can cause that enlargement, which can also perpetuate the problem even further. So just a, a, a basic um, pathophysiology, if you will. All right, so with this low metabolic rate, with this reduced cellular regulation, we're going to see a lot of physical changes in the body. So just kind of want you to stay with me for a minute. As cellular energy is decreased and metabolites that are the compounds of proteins and sugars, we think about your, your the, the buildup, right? Your body's going to start breaking things down if everything's going slow. Just start looking at where we are. So we start seeing these patients 
who can start having that buildup. Um, it, it increases the mucus retention. It increases, increases the water retention. So that causes cellular edema. So when we start looking at patients who have hypothyroidism, a lot of times we start seeing a buildup of adipose tissue and other things in certain areas, especially like this non-pitting edema um, around the eyes, around the hands and feet, between the shoulder blades. And we'll kind of talk about what that looks like in a little while. It also causes the, thumb, the tongue to be thicker. So it makes it more difficult to communicate. Um, yeah, so these are things you've seen before. This is nothing new just yet. But what we're worried about, when we think about the edema, the, 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 the mucinose and, and the myx edema, which is just kind of the edema caused by water alone. So we're talking about myx edema is the swelling. It, it's, it's just retention of fluid. So if we go down and think about an emergency situation, we think about a myx edema coma, so a hypothyroid crisis. What are we worried about? Now I'll show you in a minute. So we have to think about these kind of things because they can lead to death if we're not careful. We know that, that decreased metabolism, and I'll pull it down here, causes the heart muscle to become flabby. Oh, cardiac output. It causes the chamber size to increase. So you think about your ventricles and your atrium. We talked about hypertrophy. We talked about dil dilation of the ventricle. Anything that causes your chambers of the heart not to do their job correctly will, inadvert will inevitably result in decreased cardiac output. Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. I know we're not talking about cardiac anymore, but that's the problem with metabolism. If the metabolism goes down, the heart's not doing its job correctly. That decreased metabolism causes you to go into almost heart failure. So that decreased cardiac output, what is heart failure? The inability of the heart to do its job. Is that not the same thing? So decreased cardiac output and gas exchange in the brain and other vital organs. So you start seeing how when you go back up here and, and paying attention to, oh, gas exchange and cellular regulation, that's what we're talking about. Even the heart is impacted because it's not getting what it needs nutritional wise, and it causes it to kind of change physically. So that's what we end up looking at here. And that's kind of some of the problems. So a lot of the signs and symptoms you're going to see will be more um, apparent as, as you kind of go through here. But yeah, you just kind of got to look into this. It slows the metabolism down worse. Why? Because now we've changed the brain, right? Decreased cardiac output, decreased perfusion, gas exchange in the brain. Now the brain's like, oh, what's going on? It makes the already slow metabolism even worse because your brain's like, oh, we're not getting enough energy, so we need to slow down. That causes multiple organ failure. That's why myxedema coma can cause people to die. And we have to think about that as a life-threatening condition in an emergency situation. <laughs> All right, so what causes hypothyroidism? It depends on where you live in the world. So in the United States, um, it's typically not caused by what it is in other places in the world. Worldwide, hypothyroidism is a cause of little iodine. So when the soil and the water doesn't have enough iodine, I think of iodized salt, right? So you think about countries that don't have a lot of additives in their food, you know, people who are in maybe impoverished countries, third world countries where they have bad soil, bad water, it is not atypical at all to see somebody who has um, hypothyroidism due to that lack of iodine in the soil and water. So I like to put that out there. In America, it's usually an autoimmune disorder. So some kind of infection uh, produced by the antibodies and it causes a reduced, uh, reduced secretion of thyroid hormone. So everything in the U.S. It seems to be some kind of autoimmune disorder. I don't know what causes that yet. Um, idiopathic, they say. But there's a lot of reasons why here in the West, we have a lot of autoimmune disorders. And it's probably to do with more of the ingestion of chemicals and foods. And we don't know. We're not into that right now for our exam. So just kind of pay attention where we're at. So that's kind of what happens when you have hypothyroidism. Everything's slowed down. Metabolism slow, slowed down. Everything is slowed down. Um, and what are we going to do about it? So inter interprofessional collaboration is always something that we as nurses have to think about, right? We do our job independently as nurses. We have a scope of practice. We can do our job as a nurse independent of anybody else. There are just certain things that the patient needs that we can't offer them. And it, it requires a physician to order that. What I need you as nursing students to start understanding is that we don't call the physician to ask for stuff. We call the physician to let them know what we need. How do I know this? Because NCLEX and your exams are going to be like, hey, what kind of stuff should be ordered? Because if you don't know what the phys physician is supposed to order, how can you ensure your patient is getting what they need? You can't. So that's kind of part of it. All right. So 
when we start thinking about some of these, the, these conditions as they get worse, think about the coma here, they have to go to the ICU. That's how, that's how intense this is. And that's what kind of patients we're talking about. All right, so I've already talked about some of the causes. Surgical, if we remove your thyroid, why would we remove your thyroid? Yeah, because if you have hyperthyroidism, one of the treatments is to radiate your thyroid to make it kind of die off, if you will, and give you hypothyroidism because we can replace thyroid hormones versus if you have hyperthyroidism, we really can't do anything to get that down other than sometimes remove your thyroid gland or do some kind of radiation, uh, iodized radiation to go in there and kind of destroy parts of the thyroid gland. So yeah, like I said, th those are some of the things, uh, iron deficient, uh, iron, iodine deficiency, uh, lithium problems. So if you have a psych patients, they too could fall on the uh, hypothyroidism scale if we're not paying attention. So like I said, I'm, I'm just trying to talk you through some of these processes. You know a lot of this information. I want you to make the connections. So thinking about the history of your patient, why is history important? Because NCLEX is going to give you test questions. They're going to say, who do you see first? And they're going to give you four patients, and it's going to be based on just assessment data. So if you don't understand what somebody with hypothyroidism looks like, how are you going to know that they need to be seen immediately? That's where you have to start making the connection. So as we're going down the same vein, inadequate cellular regulation, that's what we're talking about. Why? Decrease in hormone production is going to impact certain um, uh, organs and the ability to produce more hormones. So that's what we're talking about. Um, patients often report that they have a lot of time sleeping because why? Their metabolism slow down. They're not getting the energy they need. That would be a sign and symptom. Generalized weakness, anorexia, meaning they're not hungry. They don't want to eat. Muscle aches, um, constipation, cold intolerance. Their body heat slowed down. Nothing is moving. Motility is down. Everything is down. And, and that's kind of where we're at here. And that's where you need to kind of think about what you want to, you know, see in your patients. All right. Oh, let's keep going on here. All right. So keep going down a little bit. Think about some of the, the features you would see. Common changes include um, some, some of the coarse features, edema around the eyes, the blank expression, that thick tongue. Down here are some of them. I think about pulmonary symptoms, pleural effusion. Why would we have pleural effusion? Decreased metabolism causes heart muscles to become flabby, right? Decreases cardiac output. What happens when your left side of your heart doesn't have good cardiac output? Where does it back up into? It backs up into your lungs. What is pleural effusion? You get where we're going here, right? So th there are reasons for all of this. We know that the mortality rates are very high, especially when you have a coma. The myxedema coma is caused by variants of drugs, conditions, whatever. So you need to be on the lookout for stuff like this. You are the eyes and the ear of the physician. If you're not looking, and you're not, you know, catching what's going on, how are you going to call the doctor to tell them what you need to save our patient's life? You're not going to be able to. So cardiovascular symptoms, once again, an enlarged heart, dysrhythmia is why, because when you change the structure of the heart, you get that bundle branches get displaced. There's your dysrhythmia, enlarged heart, cardiomegaly, that hypertrophic changes in the, in the ventricular uh, uh, muscle. That causes an enlarged heart, which decreases cardiac output and even decreased metabolism, I can't spell apparently, causes the heart to become, like I said, those things. Understand how the disease impacts the body and you don't have to remember signs and symptoms. You will already know, ah, it causes these changes structurally in the body. When the heart doesn't work, it always is the same thing. It always looks the same. So I just want you to go back and know some of these. I can't go through all of them with you, but weight gain will make sense. Constipation will make sense. Depression, they all make sense. Cold skin, dry hair, things of that nature are going to make sense. The lethargic uh, confusion changes because of all of that. So I just, I put in here some of these things like the cardiac, cardiac and respiratory functions that are decreased. They lead to these gas exchange problems. So, so these are all issues. Okay, so as we kind of progress through here and look at some of the signs and symptoms again, make sure that you just understand those. We talked about some of this, the, the cardiac and respiratory functions. Think about that. It leads to impaired gas exchange if your heart changes and you have heart failure now. So there we go. Weight gain is also very common because you're not metabolizing anything. Um, it's not because you're overeating. It's not because you lack self-control or discipline. 
your body just does not work the way it should. So people with hypothyroidism, you know, patient weight is a big thing. We need to think about weight. They should weigh, what did you weigh last year? What do you weigh this year? And to give you a good understanding of what's going on. All right. So a lot of people have questions about goiters and what causes a goiter. So patients may have a goiter. Some types of hypothyroidism um, don't induce goiters. Other types do. So it just kind of depends. The presence of a goiter suggests that there's a thyroid problem, but it doesn't indicate if the problem is a is a hypo or a hyper function. It just kind of depends. And there are different classifications. I don't think we get in those too much um, as far as the goiter grade is concerned, but just understanding that when you have hypothyroidism, it causes weight gain. It causes distribution of fat in different areas. It causes all kinds of side effects. So a lot of your people who come in for this are gonna come in with altered body images, right? Depression, mental health changes, a lack of um, wanting to do things that they used to do, all the things associated with depression, you know, reduced cognition, they're withdrawn. Those are the type of things that we usually see, but they also cause a mental slowness because if you're not metabolizing the energy you need, and it's not going to your brain to give it the energy. It makes you not want to go out and talk to people. It makes it hard for you to function in society. It makes it hard for you to be a part of your everyday normal life. So, all right, make sure you know some laboratory findings. I won't go over all of them with you, but if you don't understand that the basics, you know, when you think about hypothyroidism, we're talking about reducing the actual thyroid hormone, which is thyroxine, your T4, and then your T3. So TSH levels, they can be still normal. If your pituitary gland is working and there's no problem with your pituitary gland, your thyroid stimulating hormone levels will be just fine. If you have a pituitary problem, it could be a decrease or a, no, a nil normal. It just depends on what's going on. Is it primary or is it secondary hypothyroidism? I don't, I don't think we're going to differentiate that much. That seems more like an endocrinologist type thing, but understanding that lets you just let you know which kind of way to go. So go back and look at your book. Your book says this are your priority problems for a patient with hypothyroidism. Why does it matter? Because if these are your primary problems, those are your priority interventions. Those are your primary patients. Decreased gas exchange and oxygenation due to decreased energy, obesity, muscle weakness, fatigue. You're not getting good gas exchange. The actual heart muscle has changed. Hypotension and reduced perfusion due to that heart rate that went down. We already talked about that. The decreased myocardial metabolism, that decrease of that good cardiac output. And then you have complications of the myxedema coma, which can be problematic because they lead to death. So what are we worried about most? Always respiratory and cardiac problems because they're the most likely to kill you. Right, the most common cause of death amongst patients who have uh, a myxedema coma, myxedema coma is respiratory failure. So, oh, and if you don't like the way I pronounce the word, I get it. Sometimes people pronounce things differently. Just don't let it bother you. Pronounce it however you want to and move on. But this is what we're talking about. If that's what we're talking about, then what is your plan? What is your expected outcome? Why is it important? This is the nursing process, assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation. I promise you every exam question we give you will go over ADPI. It's just what we do because that's what NCLEX cares about. So come down here and think about it. With appropriate management, patient's hypothyroidism is expected to improve gas exchange. Cool. Part of our big thing is ensuring gas exchange happens. So part of our interventions will be geared towards what? Gas exchange. So when we have hypothyroidism that's very severe, the patient may require a ventilator. They very well might have to be in the ICU. So don't be afraid if you get a patient on your floor and they have hypothyroidism and things just aren't looking right and you start seeing signs and symptoms of hypoxemia, right? The pulse ox goes down, give oxygen. If the respiratory rate goes up, what can you do? Raise the head of the bed, give oxygen, see what you can do for them. If it doesn't work, man, call a rapid response, call a code, whatever you need and get this patient to uh, the unit. They'll probably be on the unit at that point anyway, but you never know. All right, I'm not going to go over all the numbers here because I don't know that they're relevant for you, but they're relevant in real life. You need to know decreased or increased. With hypothyroidism, pretty much everything is decreased. Hyper, everything is pretty much increased. It, it makes sense. What can we do to prevent problems? Well, we can't prevent the, the, the hypothyroidism. That's not for you and I to do. While we have them on in the floor with us, we're going to start thinking about what is the desired outcome? What are the expected outcomes? The planning part? What are our interventions? Once again, if we're talking about gas exchange, inadequate, adequate cardiovascular function and tissue perfusion with gas exchange. That's what we're trying to do here. So what are we going to have to control with our patient? Think about 
A patient may have decreased blood pressure, bradycardia, dysrhythmias. We have to monitor those things. Blood pressures are going to be important. Um, make sure it's a priority for the nurse to assess the client's heart rate and the blood pressure. You don't know that they're getting worse unless you check what? Circulatory issues. You need to make sure there's good gas exchange. How do we ensure there's good gas exchange? We check pulses. We get blood pressures because your vital signs will change based on your ability to perfuse. That, that is one of the, the quickest compensatory mechanisms we have. So if you're not paying attention to those, you're not really doing your job. So monitor the heart rate, look at that kind of stuff. Um, observe for signs and symptoms of shock. What are shock? We're talking about like hypovolemia, so hypotension, decreased uh, urinary output, the changes in cognition. Those are really good indicators that you're not getting good gas exchange. That's where you have to think because that's really what we're going to test you on. Um, how do we prevent a lot of these problems? Well, we have to make sure you're on your levothyroxine, which is your um, main drug that we give, right? We, we know that's the, 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 the main replacement drug. When you get this drug, though, it's not good enough to say, all right, guys, here it is. Take your drugs and have a good time. Woo. You have to give them more instruction. So if you go down here to this nursing safety alert, it says teach these patients and their families to start the drug exactly as prescribed. Don't change the dose. Don't change the schedule. Don't do anything until you talk to your physician first because they are the ones who prescribe it and they know that mechanism of injury. That is their job. Our job is to teach them about the medication, how to take it, when to take it, and if they have more questions, then you know we can call their physician as well if we can't answer it for them. But these are the things we're trying to focus on, y'all. You need to know the type of drug that's going out there. You need to know that starting a too high of a dose or increasing the dose too rapidly can cause all the opposite side, hypertension, hypo, uh, heart failure, um, hypertension, heart failure, myocardial infarction. Why? Because what we do when we give it too fast is cause you to go into uh, a thyroid storm, if you will. So when we give too much thyroid hormone, we'll talk about that in a minute. And, and when we get to a, a hyper secretion, we can kind of look at that. So drugs may need to be given IV because uh, if we give it too fast, it can cause mortality rates. So I keep saying the same things over. You have things you need to monitor for. Check their mental status changes every few hours. Elevate the head of the bed. We're talking about fluid volume here, right? Assess vital signs hourly. If you can do those things and you're looking for those type of safety issues on an exam, you should do well. How do I know this? Because I don't care about the exam. I don't. I care about you taking care of patients on the floor. NCLEX cares about you taking care of patients on the floor. That means our exams have to care about you taking care of patients on the floor. So the things I'm telling you are universal to every nursing school and every nursing program. Um, it, it really is because ATI, NCLEX, whatever you use as your measure, that's what they're testing for. So really start thinking about what your job as a nurse is. How does this apply to you? Not memorization. How are you going to realize what's going on? So here are just some of the things that I put uh, um, as far as problems that can occur. So you can just be aware. We talked about this already. Organ damage, what? Especially changes in mental status. That's why I always say that. Make sure you're, changed, you're looking for those subtle changes. I would say for you, make it, if you need to make note cards, when you get to the floor, are you more concerned about passing an exam? Or are you more concerned about taking care of real life patients? Learn this in a way that when you walk into a patient room, you know what to look for based on the diagnosis. Ah, this patient's got hypothyroidism. Based on that diagnosis by the doctor, I know it causes these changes in the body. I know that as a nurse, I assess this. This is my, my, my you know, that diagnosis. You know, if you want to think about nursing diagnosis, even though we're moving away from them, what is my plan of care? What am I going to implement? And how do I know my implement my, that my interventions actually work? That's all you got to be able to do. I know that sounds easy when I put it that way. All right, so emergency care with people who have the, this severe form of hypothyroidism, you already know, keep your patient alive. All the stuff we need to talk about. All right, um, kind of going down, we have to think about self-management and self-management is something that we really have to, to hop in. So the most important education need, and it says it right here, is about that hormone replacement therapy. You'll see that HRT. And they use that all over the book. HRT is hormone replacement therapy. You have to talk about that lifelong drug. You have to talk about both the symptoms of hyper and hypothyroidism. Why? Because hypothyroidism, if you're not taking your medication correctly, can still exist. If you're taking your medication incorrectly, it can also cause hyperthyroidism. So you really have to think about that. 
Um, nutrition, you have to eat a well-balanced meal. You have to think about fiber and fluid because everything's slowed down, but you don't want to take too much fiber because that could also screw up the absorption of the thyroid hormone itself. Um, make sure you tell your patients that you have to take this on an empty stomach. Your book says it right here, four hours, at least four hours before or after a meal. So uh, if you don't do that, it, it, it messes with the absorption of your thyroid hormone. And you can't afford that as a patient who doesn't have a thyroid gland that's working correctly. You cannot afford not to take your medication as directed. So it, that, that's what we're saying there. So that, that's where I kind of focus in on those. Um, continue with the hyperthyroidism. Focused assessment, if you want to go back and look at actual physical findings that you would be looking for, they're all here. I've talked about vital signs plenty of times. It should start making sense at this point because it changes. It changes the heart muscle, right? If you understand that, come in, go in your book, put a note, go over here and put changes the, the, heart, the heart muscle itself. Whatever you need to do, right? To, to be successful, I think about uh, hypertrophy, uh, cardiomegaly, cardiomegaly. I can't spell. I don't care. It's my book. Um, it's okay, right? You don't have to worry about it. So do those kind of things. Take notes in your book. Uh, listen to me do this. Listen to your teacher. I, I love pulling up your book in class. I know they have PowerPoints. Great. Follow along in the book. Figure out where it's sitting here. Um, we can show you in this book where all of the answers come from. I promise you. So we're not we're not taking the test from the book, we're not. We're saying the book, we're only going to take information from the book that supports the learning objectives. <clears throat> so we're not trying to focus on anything specific in the book, but I want you to know the book has all the resources you need to be successful. So that's hypothyroidism. On the flip side, we have hyperthyroidism. And I always think of my friend's wife. My, my friend Dwayne had a wife named Tiffany, and I met her when she was pregnant. And then as she was no longer pregnant and had the baby, I noticed changes in her face. And I was like, oh, hyperthyroidism. Because you can see hyperthyroidism is an overproduction. It makes all of your body systems speed up. So everything is increased. Your energy is increased. Your, your heat is increased. You're just burning calories nonstop. So it's easier to get a, 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 that, that, that sunken face, um, to lose body fat and things of that nature. It sounds like a cool idea, right? Hyperthyroidism, I'm going to lose all this weight, blah, blah, blah. But the excessive, the excessive thyroid hormone stimulates all body systems. So think about that. You know what the biggest problem is? Death. Thyroid hormones stimulate the heart, increasing stroke volume, which is great. That's why when you have hypothyroidism, you don't have that increased heart rate. You don't have that good stroke volume. Why do we care about this? Because it's good increased cardiac output, but if your heart is working too fast and too much, it puts you at risk for heart attack, myocardial infarction. So hyperthyroidism has these things with palpitations and chest pains. You're going to have that metabolic rate go up. You're going to be heat intolerance. You can already start seeing these. You've already seen a lot of these already. Photophobia, everything that increases your body's, uh, it enhances everything. It makes everything sped up. So tremors are natural. Diaphoresis, you're going to be sweating a lot. Um, it's crazy. Weight loss, you're hungry, but you can't gain any weight. Um, your, your, your increased stools, you're not constipated, you're pooping because why? Your GI is sped up as well. So you are going to be losing weight. I mean, it, it's crazy. You can't keep up with it. So look at that. You're also going to have changes in, in, in your sleep, your restlessness, your irritability, because you're not going to be able to fall asleep at night. It's going to cause manic behaviors. There's a lot to this. I, I think about my thyroid right now. I'm about to get my thyroid checked. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Here we go. All right. So that's kind of the basis of it. That's what the thyroid does. That's your hyper and hypo. So continue with hyper. Elevated thyroid hormones affect all kinds of stuff. Protein buildup and breakdown increase. What does that mean? It means we start breaking down protein and building it up. So we have a breakdown that exceeds the buildup, causing a net loss in protein. It, we, we're, we're burning things so fast that we're burning through our protein. And we know when we burn through protein, it causes all kinds of issues because protein is the building block for all of our tissue. So keep that in mind. It also causes hyperglycemia because glucose tolerance is decreased and the patient will become hyperglycemic. So everything is sped up. Fat, metabol fat, metabol blah, blah, blah. fat metabolism is increased. So it decreases your body fat. Kind of makes sense. All of these weight loss, nutritional deficits, that means you're going to have to be responsible for diet at some point on here as well. I'm talking about those high protein, high calorie diets 
initially um, before they go in and have surgery could be something that we think about. All right, so etiology, just depends on what we're talking about. The most common cause of a hyperthyroidism is something called Graves' disease or a toxic uh, goiter. So Graves' disease, also an autoimmune disorder because we don't typically get uh, any kind of thyroid problems in the United States that are associated with a lack of iodine. I mean, have you eaten in America? Everything's got iodized salt in it. So it's not very common for people here to end up with that kind of issue. All right, so as we're going through here and you're thinking about auto, uh, auto um, uh, immune disorders and the production of autoantibodies, right? So it's going to go in there and it's going to impact the ability to, to stimulate the, the, the hormones we need and things of that nature. It causes an increase in the secretion um, of some of our thyroid hormones, and that's what causes the issue. So autoimmune disorders, I mean, think about COVID. COVID causes all kinds of autoimmune disorders to pop up in people. Your genetics, your DNA makeup could make you susceptible to this. And then for whatever reason, you get a virus autoimmune and it causes Graves' disease or whatever. We don't know all of this. A lot of these things are, are, are idiopathic. We're just now learning you know, like Epstein-Barr, what is caused by, and, you know, uh, Guillain-Barre is caused by like an Epstein-Barr virus. I mean, there's so many connections we don't know. So don't get lost in the weeds. Just understand what hypothyroidism is and what hyperthyroidism is and what it causes the body. My friend, uh, my friend, Dwayne, his wife, uh, Tiffany, she had exothalamus. That's how I call it. It's your eyes start to protrude. I'll show you a picture down here. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. Also, waxy swelling to the front surfaces of the legs. We talk about that, myxedema. What is, what is that? That is a fluid retention, once again. So pretibial in front of the leg, the tibia bone. So here are the eyes, the exothalamus, and then the pretibial myxedema. It just shows that, that excess uh, fluid being brought in, if you will, in different areas. Kind of a, an interesting thought. All right, so history-wise, you're, you're not going to see a lot. You're going to see more about uh, the, their, their sped-up body systems, typically uh, lower weights, uh, loss of weight without trying. Your appetite is there, but you can't gain weight. You're pooping enough. You know, it seems like every other GI disorder you might have ever had in life. So heat intolerance. Everything starts looking the same. It truly does. So on an exam, you know, for exam two for 265, you're only going to be tested over respiratory and endocrine. So as you're starting to think about things and looking at signs and symptoms, you only have to focus on the stuff you learned over these three weeks, right? These few chapters. Take your test according to what you're going over this week. Start thinking about what would cause it based on these signs and symptoms in this specific uh, range of uh, diseases. All right, so I, I won't get too much in there, but you can start looking, you can go back and see this photophobia. You can see why there's excessive tearing and bloodshot appearance of the eyes. If you ever wonder why, I don't know that we're gonna hit you on that. What are we gonna hit you on? The things that are gonna kill your patient the fastest, y'all. So don't palpate a goiter. Why? Because if you start palpating a goiter, what are you gonna, a, 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 a thyroid, if you stimulate the thyroid, what is it gonna release? Thyroid hormones. So if we already have hyperthyroidism and you start messing with it, the actions can stimulate even a quicker, sudden release of the thyroid hormone. And that's what we call thyroid storm. So it's important for you to understand thyroid storm is going to present with an increased body function, systolic blood pressure through the roof. I mean, over 140, you can get to the 200s, y'all. Tachycardic to the 200. Dysrhythmia is where we have heart um, palpitations and, and we can go into VFib if we're not careful. So that's what we care about. That's what's going to kill your patient. And I don't, I don't mean that arbitrarily. My five kids go to the hospital. Your mother and father and your children go to the hospital. The last thing you want is for a nurse not to pay attention to your family. I, I mean this wholeheartedly. I need you guys to start thinking like nurses and not like nursing students. The quicker you start thinking about what your job is, the easier it is to understand how to treat patients on an exam. So check the blood pressure. Um, uh, psychosocial assessment. Hyperactivity often leads to fatigue, inability to sleep. Uh, they're, they're always having two moods. They're, they're either, you know, a ball, I don't know how to say that any other way, a full speed ahead or completely stop. Like they are either just on it or they're not. Almost manic depressive if you're not uh, paying attention. I, I know it's not even remotely the same, but a lot of people can confuse the two. You're like, oh, you're always so depressed and lethargic or you're always just so active. 
very much could be hyperthyroidism. So just we're not differentiating. We're not trying to diagnose people. We're not. We're on a floor for 12 hours with six patients, and we need to be aware, astutely aware of what's going on with them. All right, so inter uh, what can we do here? So we go down and think about how we're going to treat this. Some of the inter uh, interventions, um, if you're thinking about Graves' disease and how it can cause your, your systems to get really, really um, increased, think about drug therapies and then the radio ablation. I mentioned this earlier. What we do typically to correct hyperthyroidism is to do some kind of radio ablation where they go in there and, and it's kind of like carterizing, if you will. You, you, you go in there and, and, and kind of get rid of part of the, the thyroid. Um, you could do a surgery where you go in there, remove it all together. You could do a radioactive iodine to kind of do certain things. So there are multiple ways to manage it. Just understand that typically what we do is reduce uh, try to reduce the thyroid's ability to reduce, uh, to, to submit or secrete thyroid hormones. So a lot of times that's going to be some kind of radio ablation or surgery to get rid of it. Um, why? Because you're going to have a heart attack and die. It, trust me, it's, it's, it's better to reduce that stimulation. So the priority nursing care, what can we do with a patient who's laying in bed and has hyperthyroidism? Reduce stimulation, close the door, turn down the lights, promote comfort. Whatever the patient needs, if they need an anti-analytic, it is okay. Tell your provider, hey, provider, our patient has hyperthyroidism and they're very anxious. I think it might, they might benefit from an anti-analytic. And then your physician can say yes or no. That is my job as a nurse is to advocate for my patient. All right, so when you have Graves' disease, you have this present with uncontrolled hyperthyroidism. What does that mean? High fevers, severe hypertension. What does that mean to you? I put over here in the notes, I highlighted it. Immediately report a temperature, even if it's only one degree Fahrenheit, right? That's what we're talking about. If, if, if you delegate something like that to a patient, you need to make sure you give clear guidance. Hey, I need you to come back and report to me exactly what the temperature was, regardless. I don't care what it is. I need you to immediately come back and let me know. Or if you trust them, hey, if it's more than one degree than it was last time, come back, whatever, whatever. I would highly recommend that if you haven't already checked out my um, test taking strategy um, review that I did uh, last week, go back into the same area. I had the recording posted. It is stellar on how to look at test questions and really figure out delegation, prioritization, and management of care questions. All right. So kind of moving on. Environment. I already talked about these kind of things. Know what you can do as a nurse. If you don't know what your job is, how can you do your job? All right. Um, Go back and look at look at medications too. You have to know medication names. Uh, you don't have to pronounce them, but it's important to know what kind of medications that we're that we're dealing with because they are going to show up. I promise you. I'll show you some more medications towards the end here. But um, think about it. Some medications have side effects. Some of them have. They'll cause your urine to turn really dark. Uh, a, a yellow appearance of the skin, kind of jaundicey. The whites of the eyes can turn a little yellow which indicates what? Possible liver toxicity or liver failure. Some of these medications are nephrotoxic and they're not good for you. So it's important that any medication you ever have to, you don't prescribe, but any medication you're ever required to administer, if you don't know what those side effects are and you don't know what to teach your patient to look out for, ask yourself this, are you really doing no harm? Are you doing what your job is as a nurse? The answer is no, and you can lose your license from that. So it is imperative that you understand the medications, at least for the exam purposes right now, what medications and what they can or can't do, right? Because if you don't know these kind of things, you can kill patients. That's never acceptable. You can cause uh, uh, sentinel events, never events. We don't ever need those in life. So it's important. When you get to your floor, you have your cell phone before you ever give a medication. If you're not familiar, look it up real quick on the exam. Make sure you look in the book and know certain medications, especially the ones that really pop out. All right, here's your radioactive uh, iodine therapy. Um, this is the one where we give it to the patient and it can go in and cause problems. Uh, well, I also want to put this right here for you. I forgot to say this one. The other medication, I just missed it. Drug therapy, birth defects. So if you're in your first trimester, you can't have it. So a lot of women find out they have hyperthyroidism when they get pregnant and they have to go through a lot of treatments. All right, so we'll kind of move on from there. Radioactive therapy, once again, if you're pregnant, it crosses the placenta so it can damage the, the, the fetal thyroid gland. So we don't want to do that either. Sometimes I had a friend, she had hyperthyroid, she had th thyroid cancer as a matter of fact, and she just went through it. 
she just we had the baby and then treated the thyroid cancer. Her father, oddly enough, is an endocrinologist. She's a nurse I worked with. It's fascinating what your body's capable of. So understand that these people are going are to take the medication in. That makes them what? It makes them now a source of radiation. So radiation therapy is typically done on outpatient, but the radiation is low, so it doesn't really affect a lot. But you need to start thinking about what you're going to teach your patient, right? So we'll get down there in a second. That's one, that's one option. So when you do the radioactive iodine, like I said, safety precautions require a lot of stuff. I've already put this on here. Keep, keep three feet away from pregnant women, infant and children. We talked about that right up here, right? Um, sit when you urinate so you don't pee all over the place and get your radiation everywhere. Use disposable tissues, not like a cloth or, you know, don't, don't wipe your nose on a towel or clean that. What do you call those things? Handkerchiefs. Um, yeah, there's a lot. You're trying to reduce the spread. That becomes your focal point when you're actually on radioactive iodine. Time and distance. The, the less amount of time you're around somebody, the better off you are, right? Remain at least three feet away. I've talked about that. Limit your exposure to no more than an hour. Time and distance is always the same. I'm telling you what nurses have. I've been a nurse for, I started in the medical field in 1995 when I joined the Navy. So I've been doing this for a long time. I'm not the greatest at everything in the world. I don't know everything, but I've been doing something long enough that I know how nurses are supposed to think because I've ran ERs and trauma centers across the world. And when somebody walks in, I got split seconds to figure out what I think is wrong with you. Not based on your diagnosis, based on your signs and symptoms. And they all look the same. So that's what you're trying to get proficient at. All right, I kind of talked about some of this down here. Go back and look at it. I talked about the importance of maybe having to have a high protein, high carbohydrate diet weeks before the surgery because the patient is burning through everything. Stress, the importance of looking for uh, 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 problems, stress, the importance of, of, of supporting your neck when you cough or when you move. Put both hands behind your neck to reduce strain on the incision. We also don't want to, depending on what thyroid is there or not, we also don't want to stimulate the thyroid and cause a thyroid storm. We don't want to do anything to cause the patient to have problems. So based on where the thyroid is located, right here in your neck, right? If we go back and look at some of these pictures, you can start seeing uh, maybe... Like right here, you're talking about a goiter, your thyroid is in your throat. So if we're going to go in there and cut your thyroid out, because that's what we just talked about right here. Let me go back to the spot. We've been talking about um, medications and, and radioactive therapy. We also got to talk about surgical uh, management. What we typically do, like if we have Graves disease or other type of hyperthyroidism that is not able to be managed by non-surgical methods, we remove it. We can do a total thyroidectomy or a subtotal thyroidectomy. When we do that, it puts your patient at further risk for stuff. Imagine cutting somebody's throat. When we cause any kind of tissue trauma, what does that bring in? It brings white blood cells. So the macrophage can come in and start breaking down dead tissue. Necrotic tissue has to be eaten up, right? Actually, it produces a, a nice flavor for your white blood cells that come in and eat it. They are attracted to it. So they're going to come in and eat it. When white blood cells come in, it brings fluid. It causes swelling. What happens when you have swelling in your respiratory tract, your, your airway? Exactly. You get an included airway that would kill you fast. So it's going to be important that your patient, you as a nurse, understand that you have to have a, a, a um, crike kit. You have to have a surgical cricoidotomy kit or, or some kind of intubation tray, something by the bedside to ensure that if your patient goes into an airway obstruction, y'all can save their life. So I like to put that out there and just kind of stress the importance of that. Keep an emergency tracheostomy equipment at the bedside. It talks about it right down here. Respiratory distress, reduced gas exchange can result from swelling. Also, let's not forget about tetany. What is tetany, Mr. Strad? Oh, that's right. Because when you come in here and you do a surgical removal, sometimes you do subtotal, sometimes you do a total. But what's beside the thyroid? Your parathyroid. Now, we have parathyroid in just a second. So parathyroid controls calcium and things like that nature. So we're going to have to look at that also. We'll look at strider. Look at the... the, the uh, um, respiratory obstructions and things of that nature. I've already kind of talked about thyroid storm and thyroid crisis already. So just make sure you understand what that means. It's uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, Graves disease. It will kill you. It becomes fatal quickly. If you got a trauma in the neck, if you got strangled, you got hit in the throat, you got hit with a baseball, um, you were in a car wreck and the seatbelt got you. All of those things should have you understanding that there might be 
some kind of a need to, to start assessing for thyroid problems. Key symptoms include fever, tachycardia, and systolic hypertension because your body systems are always, always, always elevated. All right, so keep that in mind. So that's, that's, that's the first part. Um, now let's just pop into parathyroid, uh, the hypo and the hyper, and we'll be done with this, uh, this part of the um, content this week. So your parathyroid gland is all about that balance between calcium and phosphate. They definitely have an inverse relationship. So as your calcium levels go down, phosphate goes up and vice versa. So understanding um, what that looks like, it will also help you understand the treatments for patients who might have their parathyroid gland removed. So we have to think about that balance. Um, it's a very narrow range though. And when it's not where it should be, it really impacts your muscles. Um, we also know that the parathyroid secretion of the parathyroid hormone directly impacts what? The kidney, causing increased kidney reabsorption of calcium and increased phosphorus excretion. So when we have a parathyroid problem, we also end up going back here and thinking about kidney stuff. It's all related, y'all. Nothing happens in the vacuum in the body. It all relates to something else. That's why care plans are so imperative. So think about with hypothyroidism. Think about your serum calcium levels being low. We call that hypocalcemia. What is a priority? A priority patient who had a thyroidectomy hours ago was reporting what? Tingling in the fingers, positive trizo sign, report tingling in the hands and the lip. You know, when you have that uh, uh, chubbick sign, you know, when you touch the face and you start having facial spasms. Those are important for you to understand, not just on a patient with hypothyroidism, but a patient with hyperthyroidism who has had surgery, we have to really be cautious of exciting or, or, or destroying part of the parathyroid gland because it's going to lead to hypocalcemia and it's going to have all those signs and symptoms. Uh, once again, the same thing can be said with the, if you have a serious injury to your neck or anything else in a car crash or whatever else, um, it, it could also cause parathyroid problems, hypo. So like I said, here's all the stuff. Make sure you're looking for fingers tingling, the, the uh, Chovec sign, the Trezo sign, those are what you're looking for. Implement seizure precautions in these clients. If you have a patient who suffered any kind of throat strangulation injury, something like that, your nursing brain has to say, ah, there's a thyroid there. If that thyroid is not doing what it needs to do, we could have seizures and stuff as well. So put them on seizure precautions because of the, the muscle excitability. All right. With hyper, sorry, with hyperparathyroidism, kind of the opposite there. So we have a hypercalcemia and we hypophosphatemia. So we don't have enough phosphate. It really is a, a balancing act here. So some of the treatments for one or the other, if you have hyperthyroidism and you have hypercalcemia, we might give you what? We're going to give you the other side. So if we're talking about phosphorus, we'll give you, we'll give you phosphorus to help bring down your serum calcium levels. On the other side, if you're hyper, we will give you more calcium and it kind of goes that direction. If we're talking about calcium, we're talking about uh, phosphates, we have to think about how these increase the reabsorption of calcium. So if we have hypercalcemia, where did the calcium come from? We didn't drink the calcium or eat the calcium. So what happened? What we ended up with is that reabsorption of calcium from the bones. So this puts our patient at risk for all kinds of osteoblastic bone, you know, all these things. So it puts them at um, uh, a bone destruction, osteo, uh, 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 osteoblastic. I can't say these words sometimes, but I want you to understand that it puts them at re risk for any kind of osteotype mellitus, osteo fractures. That's what you're trying to focus on somewhat. Also, don't forget that when we have kidney disease, this is impacted as well. So your patients are going to be problematic, especially when they have comorbidities. So when I think hyperparathyroidism, I think about the same uh, mix of calcium and phosphorus, but I think about that bone, right? So as, if you're thinking about bone fractures, that's something. If you have a patient with a history of bone fractures, you might need to see if they had radiation to their head or neck. Maybe they had throat cancer. Maybe they had brain cancer. Mm -hmm. So they had, they had breast cancer, maybe even. It depends on what kind of radiation they use. It could have radiation that impacts their parathyroid gland. So if you have a, a person who is post any kind of treatment like that with radiation, it's very likely that they have parathyroid problems. So look for the signs and symptoms, things that put you out there. All right, diuretics and hydration therapy is huge. 
to reduce calcium levels, right? Um, if, if we get furosemide, we know that furosemide is, is something that increases the kidney to excrete calcium. And then it's used with IV saline to help promote that calcium excretion as well. So that is something you should expect. If you have a patient who is in hyper, hyperthyroidism, we, you should be expecting diuretics to get rid of the calcium. You should be expecting uh, so IV um, so, uh, normal saline because normal saline is also going to get rid of some of the um, uh, calcium. Those are nursing things. IV phosphates are used when serum calcium levels are way too uh, high and they need to be lowered rapidly because we need to stop you from going into some of these seizures once again. So that's an ICU type patient. Preventing injuries. Think about putting your patient on a fall precaution because we already know that they're going to have bone problems because we're reabsorbing the calcium out of the bones. Y'all, that is it. So if you have questions, please go back and re-watch this video again. And then if you still don't understand it, make sure you book an appointment with myself or Nancy McConnell so you can ask specific questions so we can help you there. All right, hope you have a great day and we'll talk uh, sooner than later, I'm sure of it.